So the speedrun definitely is getting more interesting. And the games have a lot more meat on the bone. We're 1355. Hopefully we get a couple games with black so we can really flesh out uh, some accelerated dragon theory. Let's roll the cameras. Hope you guys can hear me fine. Let me know because I, I, wanna, I always want to make sure that when I do YouTube videos, the sound is okay. So if I'm peaking or something, let me know. But it should be good. Singular 1400 and we're facing the English C4. Now, my recommendation against 1D4 is going to be... Well, I actually haven't decided yet whether I'm recommending the King's Indian or the Grunfeld. I'm leaning toward recommending the Grunfeld as my official recommendation against 1D4 openings. Now, against C4, if you want to be a principled Andy, you have to learn E5, right? So the way that I'm building this opening repertoire for you in the speedrun, I'm trying to teach you the most principled lines, the lines that are going to annoy your opponent the most. And even if your rating is on the lower side, you want to avoid taking opening shortcuts, right? And it's easy to take a shortcut and say, hey, I'm a Queen's Gambit Decline player. I'm going to go E6 and D5 here. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if you want to play principal chess, the move that really takes it to white is E5. And here there's a fork in the road, which we'll talk about after the game. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context on English opening theory. Of course, you can think of this as a reversed closed Sicilian. So Knight C3 is the main move. And here, once again, black has a bunch of different viable setups. There's the move bishop f8 to b4, which if you've watched my blitz games, you'll notice that I play this move almost exclusively, but it leads to some incredibly complex positional struggles. And I think a simpler line, a more approachable line for players of intermediate level is just to develop the knight for now to f6. This does not commit to any system of development in particular. Well, it's not totally true. It uh, prevents us from pushing our pawn to f5, which constitutes a rather ambitious but viable response to, to the English. So we're precluding the possibility of f5. And here, once again, another fork in the road for black. There's a bunch of different possibilities here. We're going to play the move d5 uh, in this game, reaching a reverse accelerated dragon. That's really how you should think of this opening. It's an accelerated dragon where white is an extra tempo. And, of course, black is playing white. There's, of course, the move bishop b4 here as well, which is similar to bishop b4 in the previous move. You can just continue developing with knight c6, but after the game, I will show you a typical scenario that often happens to players who are not familiar with English theory. The dangerous thing about this setup from black's perspective is that if you just develop your pieces without a second thought, if you just put your pieces on natural squares very often you actually end up getting under serious positional pressure. And I'll give you a couple examples of that after the game. So in this case, we are going to play the most principled move, which is d7, d5. And I'm going to write down some stuff to not forget it. Show examples of misplaying. All right. And obviously we take back with the knight. And bishop g2. So our opponent continues to follow the natural path. Now here, you might be tempted extrapolating from uh, the theory of the accelerated dragon to play the move bishop e6. But it's important to remember that we are down a tempo. So bishop e6 here is actually inaccurate, I think, for several reasons. Uh, but most importantly, it allows to, to white to strike with an early d2, d4, which leads to tension in the center that black is not entirely prepared for because black is the one down a tempo. So the move here, it's not c6 either because again, c6 allows d4. We want to play a clever move that prevents d4 and increases our clamp on the d4 square. In fact, the battle is going to revolve in the opening largely around our ability to prevent first and foremost the d2, d4 pawn break. And that is why we drop our knight back to b6. We also don't take on c3 because that trade in the Sicilian, and by extension in the reverse Sicilian, plays right into white's hands. It increases white's control of the center, and it helps white, white push d4, and it opens the b-file, which you might notice there is a b7 pawn that the bishop is already pressuring. Knight f3, we obviously respond with knight to c6, defending the pawn, and once again preventing d4. And then our dark squared bishop in, in such positions, a little context for people watching on YouTube, I, I just played a long blitz session and I was talking about how a lot of chess GMs and commentators, they like to use the phrase in such positions. 
especially with a Russian accent. Okay, in such positions, okay, you try to push, you know, these pawns, and in such positions, okay, the plan is typical, yeah, okay. And I think it's an overrated phrase because even the players and people who use that phrase don't exactly know what it means. Um, so in such positions, the dark squared bishop belongs on e7. No, in this precise position, the dark squared bishop belongs on e7 and only on e7. What are the other possibilities of development? Well, we could play bishop d6, but once again, I'm a broken record, but bishop d6 walks right into d4. Now, the move bishop c5 is harder to refute, and it might make sense from a logical standpoint, right? You're just making it even harder for white to push d4. But the bishop on c5, you might notice, is vulnerable to several different things. First and foremost, there's this idea of playing a3, b4 that you should be familiar with if you're a Sicilian player. There's also uh, the annoying knight jump to e4. A white could also put the queen on c2 and x-ray the bishop. So you should notice that the bishop on c5 just is a little bit unsafe. And so we want to develop a little bit more modestly here with bishop e7, all right? And then we want a castle, and then we want to bring the other bishop out, usually to e6, as white often does in the Sicilian. Of course, you could also bring it out to g4, but the bishop on g4 in such positions doesn't really do anything. And when I say in such positions here, I mean positions with a fee and kettled bishop, right? You could play bishop g4, but it's a paper tiger. That pin is not dangerous at all. White plays e3. Okay, so here it's important to talk about the idea uh, of changed circumstances, right? I just talked a lot. I talked up a storm about the importance of, preparing, of preventing d4. So extrapolating from that, you might say, hey, e3 threatens d4. Well, let's stop d4 at all costs. And you might come up with an idea like queen to d3. Or you might say, well, let's go bishop g4. Let's try to pin this knight to make d4 as difficult as possible. But pawn moves change the structure. And so you have to reassess the danger level of these ideas when the structure changes. And what you might notice is that after white plays d4 in this version, that's not nearly as dangerous as it was just a couple moves ago. Because here, we trade on d4. White has to recapture with the pawn eventually. And what kind of structure do we reach as a result? Well, that's called the IQP structure, the isolated queen pawn structure. And a shorthand way of evaluating who's better in an IQP structure is to see who controls the square in front of the isolated queen pawn and just to look to see whether the side with the isolated pawn has attacking chances against the opposing side's king, which is often the appeal of playing an IQP structure. And here, in both cases, uh, this position favors us. I um, mean, queen d3, by the way, not a bad move at all. Not a bad move at all. It's, it's a high-level move. But in this game, we're going to play it simple, and we're actually going to allow the move d4. And what I'm going to attempt to show you is that in the resulting position, we control the d5 square, and we control the keys to the kingdom. Our opponent confidently blitzes out d4. We take on d4. And of course, white can't, can take back with a knight, but we're just going to trade knights. And potentially, we're even going to trade queens. I'm not totally sure we're going to trade queens there. We'll see. We'll cross that bridge if we get there. But um, our opponent takes back with a pawn. I actually think knight takes d4 might have been the only clear path to equality for white. And I'll show you guys why afterward. What is the key move in this position? It's harder to shoot at a moving target. Remember that. And it's important to pile up on the square in front of the IQP. So what developing move fits the bill here? Well, if we play knight d5 immediately, right? It's less important to occupy the square than it is to control it. And don't confuse occupying a square with controlling it. These are two separate things. If you play knight d5, what you're allowing is knight takes d5, queen takes d5, and then a knight jump to e5, opening up a discovery on the queen, and things get really unpleasant. We kind of slip away from the ledge. The move is bishop e6. Bishop to f6 is interesting. You're attacking the pawn, but you're still allowing the pawn to push forward to d5. Now you might say, hey, in that position, you have knight b4. And I agree. Bishop f6 is actually a great move here, but we're trying to play sort of strict positional chess. I'm trying to play by the rules, kind of lack of creativity, and that's by design. So hopefully we'll get a chance to outplay our opponent in this position. So we have achieved what we set out to do. I would say that black is maybe only a tiny smidge better. Uh, maybe the position is still even equal because the IQP in this case is not a big weakness for white. White can defend it quite easily with bishop e3. So it's not like white is losing this pawn imminently. Um, but it is somewhat of a liability. Of course, white has the major asset as they do in the English, which is this fianchettoed bishop. 
uh, which sits on a very nice long diagonal. But our pieces are, are also very nicely positioned. Everything is very compact. Everything is close to the center. And we've got many more ways to improve our position. You should already, just by looking at this for a couple of moments, identify a bunch of ways in which you can A, intensify the pressure on the isolated queen pawn, and B, simply improve your position and bring more pieces into the game. And there's kind of a classic way to continue doing that. What am I talking about? What's the sort of very traditional follow-up in, in such positions? There is bishop f6 once again, by the way. But I'm talking about queen d7. And we just have to test that queen d7, knight e5, we can trade. And white does get rid of the IQP there. So that is a drawback of queen d7. It's the move knight to e5 in response. And then after the trade, white takes back with a pawn. And I'm not entirely sure what to make of the resulting structure. So that might be something that's worth dodging. Maybe we should start with the move bishop f6 and hit the pawn first and control the e5 square. So let's calculate. Bishop f6, I'm a little bit concerned about this weird-looking move, knight c3 to e4, which seems to invite black to take the pawn on d4. We capture d4. But if you keep calculating after knight takes d4, knight takes d4, the knight from e4 jumps into c5. That's a lot of arrows. That's a long line. But uh, at the end of the line, the knight on d4 is loose. The pawn on b7 is hanging. So that just doesn't inspire confidence. But after bishop f6, knight e4, bishop takes d4, Knight takes d4. We can actually take on d4 with the queen. And the point of inducing a queen trade is that in the resulting position after queen d4, knight d4, knight c5. And this will be impressive if somebody can get this. What is black's move in that resulting position? Hopefully you were able to follow along. What's black's move in the position after knight c5 with the queens off the board? What does black have? It's knight c2. There's a fork on c2. And even if you didn't visualize the line, you should see that the rooks are on forkable squares. A black's knight from d4 jumps into c2. And so on the basis of this line, and I will say that at a grandmaster level, the position is entirely unclear. I mean, I, I think our opponent has done a, a phenomenal job in the opening thus far. But white has more at stake here if he goes wrong. Okay? If white makes a couple passive moves, he's going to slip into passive mode. Bishop e3 played. And once again, we think about queen d7. But yet again, queen d7 runs into knight e5, unfortunately. And after knight e5, d5, we lose the pawn on b7 at the end of the line. So I actually still don't want to go queen d7. I amend what I just said. But what we can do instead is increase our control of the square in front of the IQP. And the more familiar you are with typical plans in IQP structures the more fluent you will be at finding these types of ideas. What we're going to do here is a very typical move, knight c6 to b4. And don't be fooled by the aggressive appearance of this move. This achieves the same thing that knight e7 would achieve. It's just that knight e7 allows the extra option of knight f3 to g5. Right? We're keeping a very close eye on this knight on f3 because by moving it, white is opening up the long diagonal, which could be unpleasant. Now, you might say, well, what about knight e5 here? Well, knight e5 doesn't make contact anymore with any of black's pieces, so it's less dangerous. We can just leave that knight sitting on e5. It's not really bothering us, and the knight from b4 can drop back to d5, establishing what's called the blockade. And once the blockade is established, well, that's a step in the right direction. Um, queen c8 was a very good move, actually. Queen c8 and rook d8 would have put the rook on an x-ray with the white queen. Maybe it was even the best move. I'm not claiming that I'm playing this in the best way. So we quickly drop the knight back to d5. And I think a grandmaster approach for white would be to play knight c3 to e4 and aim the knight for this very juicy square on c5. That's kind of annoying. And our opponent is firing on all cylinders. Okay, let's think. I kind of like the move queen to c8 here with black. Basically, we are not so worried about dropping our bishop. I mean, I don't love giving up the bishop and so bishop e7 comes to mind. But bishop e7, knight c5 hits the bishop, hits the b7 pawn at the same time. And that's a little bit iffy. So let's actually calculate. Bishop e7, knight c5. Now we can take the bishop on e3 in that resulting position. Then the rook recaptures. Ah, and then we have a nice little reshuffling. I think I found something promising. I think I found something promising. But it's complicated. And I think white has a way to bail out into equality there. Nonetheless, bishop e7, knight c5, knight takes e3, rook takes e3. 
And then we just play bishop e6 to d5. Okay, we can also do this immediately. We can replace the knight with the bishop. Knight takes e3 and then bishop d5 in this position. Okay, does that idea kind of make sense? What we're trying to do is take the sting out of the move knight e4 to c5, which with the bishop already on d5 no longer carries the threat. So I actually think this might be the simplest approach, but we're going to start... The, see, the problem with knight takes e3 is that it allows f takes e3, and white essentially un IQPs his pawn. This is a positive pawn structure transformation for white. We're going to play bishop e7. I need to accelerate my pace just a little bit. I'm running off at the mouth here. Um, so we're going to wait for knight c5 and then play knight takes e3. And the idea of switching the move order like that is that in that position, if white plays f e3, we can snap the knight off the board and ruin white's pawn structure permanently. Bishop takes e5, dc, and then the knight can jump into c4 and start harassing a bunch of white's pawns. The position remains extremely unclear there, but it seems to me that black has perhaps a slightly easier game. So, yeah, this is definitely thus far... There was one guy we played in a Rosalimo, if you remember a couple, vid couple videos ago, where our opponent basically hung with me on equal terms for most of the game. And thus far, I, I have to give major props to my opponent. I mean, this is not, black is not better here. I think I misevaluated this slightly. I was a little over optimistic based on the fact that we have control of the square in front of the IQP, but my opponent is convincing me otherwise. What, what, what white is doing so expertly is using the IQP and making the most of it, right? When you've got a weak pawn, you have to compensate for that with active piece play. And this is precisely what White is doing. White is playing very actively, doing everything he can to disrupt the coordination of our pieces. And this is almost a blunder, but it's not. Oh my gosh, knight g5. So it looks like a blunder. Why? Because knight takes e3 snaps off the defender of the g5 knight, but our opponent sees knight takes e6 in return which leads to more complications. Knight takes d8, knight takes d1, knight takes d8. And if knight takes b2, then knight takes on b7 and white is okay. So one simple option for black here is to play knight takes e3, knight takes d6, take the queen, and then simply take the knight on d8. And after rook a takes d1, we play the move like c6. And perhaps black is just a tiny bit better, but that's going to be a tough end game to win. That's going to be a tough end game to win. The alternative in this position is, of course, to play bishop f5. What we do not want to allow is knight takes d6. And this is a tough decision even for me. So let me think about this for a second. I like the look of bishop f5. I feel like knight g5 is a paper tiger. I feel like this is a paper tiger, and I think we should keep the pieces on the board. Let's give it a shot. I don't see a follow-up for white. I, I think white has succumbed slightly to one move-itis and has granted us an important tempo because now, of course, knight takes e3 is a massive threat. Actually, very easy to blunder, right? Very easy to forget that this is a move. Because our opponent might fall on, into the illusion that, oh, the knight on d5 is our strongest piece, so we're not going to give it away. Very common reason for blunders when you make a positional assumption that, oh, one piece is stronger than another, so the trade is not going to happen, right? I think you kind of see what I'm saying, but you fail to evaluate the position concretely and to see that the trade is warranted for tactical reasons. Now, white is experiencing some logistical problems here because apart from knight takes e3, both of our bishops are making contact with both of our opponent's knights, which is not a pleasant scenario for white. The best move here for white, and, and it's not an easy move for, you know, for, 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 a, for a newer player to play, not because, you know, not trying to, to condescend, this is just an objectively difficult thing to do, is just to kind of make a zen move like bishop e3 back to c1. And I think this is what white should actually play. And the point is to prevent knight takes c3. And if we play h6 in that position, which we very well might, the knight just drops back to f3. And there we go, right? I, I kind of called it, our opponent just collapses. He, he's unable to deal with everything that's going on and short circuits and gives us a free piece. We have several ways to win the piece. We can play knight takes c3 because the knight on g5 is literally now hanging. But... While we're at it, and white is going to get a pawn for the piece, right? What we don't want to do is play bishop takes g5 first. That would be a huge mistake because then if you look very carefully, well, actually, maybe we can get away with that move, but white has knight takes d5. Oh, actually, that's an interesting idea. No, it doesn't work. Bishop takes g5, knight takes d5. Knight takes d5, bishop takes g5, and our queen is overextended. We're going to end up giving back the knight on d5. 
So let's play it simple and let's do what we originally intended and just play knight takes e3. And yes, we are allowing white to improve his structure. By the way, the same would have been the case after knight takes c3. It would have done the other thing on the other side, leading to what's called a hanging pawn structure. But what I like here is that we have the bishop pair. I love that we have the bishop pair and we have an extra bishop and we have an extra dark squared bishop. And the reason that's important is because the pawn on e3 has now become a target. Essentially, the target has shifted one file to the left from the IQP to now the pawn on e3, which can be easily targeted with a knight from c4, with a rook from e8. And if we can get white to play e4, another kind of idea that a lot of players will stumble on, they think, oh, this is an intimidating move. No, it's not. Because now, once again, the target has shifted. And again, the target has shifted to the d4 pawn. White's center may seem imposing, but it's actually a massive liability. We have an extra piece, and we can easily use our minor pieces to harass white center and provoke more weaknesses. But we got to be careful about how we do it. The careless bishop g6 actually loses the piece. Who can tell me why? What happens after bishop g6? And don't worry, I will speed up just a little bit here in the late middle game, which means I might not explain as thoroughly. But these couple next moves are still important. What happens after bishop back to g6? Yeah, h4. And we're going to have to sack our bishop for two pawns because if we move our bishop back there, white can actually throw in e5 and then h5. And we want to avoid that with a 10-foot Pull. Yeah, we do. So instead, we should move the bishop on this diagonal. Where should we go? Well, we can go back to e6, but then that allows d5 with tempo. So I think we shouldn't hesitate to play what may seem like an awkward move. Actually, the more I look at this, I think bishop c8 was actually the best move. Just drop the bishop back to its initial square, but leave open the queen's contact with the d4 pawn. And later on, we're going to redeploy that bishop as necessary. Bishop d7 is also good. We're up a piece, for goodness sakes. And this has the benefit of being able to put the bishop on c6 in the event that white pushes the e-pawn, which knowing, you know, player around 1400, I think he might be tempted by e5. I also think he might be very tempted by the one move itis move h4, which is no longer dangerous, and which will send our bishop back to e7. Big whoop, right? Our pieces are temporarily a little bit passive. So what's going to be our... our kind of broad plan here. It's hard to talk about a plan because the position is very volatile, right? It can change in a variety of ways and that will in turn change our approach. Why can push the D pawn or the E pawn or why can play on the king side? So it, it doesn't make sense here to come up with a specific plan for black. But on a broad level, the way in which we can improve our position is to make moves such as C6, Queen C7 and bring the rooks into the game. I think that's an important step which all plans are going to share in common is that the rooks ultimately we're going to try to put on d8 and on e8 to create the backbone of the pressure that we're ultimately going to put on white's center pawns. We're also going to be very attentive to the moment that white pushes one of the center pawns. The moment he does so, it creates weaknesses, square weaknesses. If white plays e5, we can take out the fianchettoed bishop with bishop c6. Okay, knight e2 is super passive and it's not imposing at all. And this gives us a chance to really take the initiative away from White's hands. We have a super high-level positional move here, which we're going to make. And I'm going to explain the logic behind it. Now, first thing I see is that knight e2 has a concrete drawback, okay? What is its concrete drawback? Well, it allows a check on e3, which I know some of you guys are seeing. But the check alone isn't that effective. Bishop e3, king h1. But you can combine that check with an idea that aims at chipping away at White's center. Right, You can ship away at white center, and I call this carving out. What you're doing is you're provoking a pawn move in order to create a, a weakness on a color complex. In this case, obviously, the color complex we want to weaken are the dark squares because we have an extra dark squared bishop. So how do we induce a weakness on the dark square complex? What we, what we need to provoke is the move d4, d5. If we provoke that move, what I want you to notice is that all of these dark squares in the center become really weak, particularly the e5 square, which can be used as an outpost for either the knight or the bishop. So how do we provoke white into playing d5? There's a couple of ways to do it, but there is one super classy tactical move that we can play, and some of you are already seeing it. I did not mention bishop e3 by accident. This plays an integral role in the tactical justification. It's not bishop c6, because that doesn't actually create any threats. It is the move c7, c5. And of course, the tactical part is that if white plays dc, we fork the pawn with our bishop, bishop e3. We can recapture it. 
And you might say, well, why is that good? Well, that's good because it trades upon it. It opens up the center. And when you're up a piece, that's exactly what you want. We have achieved what we want here. And we have two approaches. We can occupy the square with our bishop. We can play bishop f6. Or we can play the, the sexy looking knight c4 and throw a knight onto e5, which looks absolutely fantastic. And that's actually what we're going to do. Let's go knight c4. And we're keeping the bishop on g5. Maybe bishop b3 will come in handy. I think knight c4 is more flexible and it's more aggressive. And it should be self-evident to all of you why the knight on e5 is such a monster piece. An outpost like that just sits on the position. It makes it impossible for white to do anything. It takes the bishop on g2 entirely out of commission. And, you know, you're beginning to see hopefully why it is that people make such a big fuss out of weakening squares and weakening complexes of squares. And a square complex is just a, a set of dark squares. In this case, the complex is in the center, right? E5 is weak, but also E3 is weak, and D4 is weak, and B2, one could argue, is weak as well. So it's the set of dark squares in the center that white has weakened, and so by occupying it, we hold the keys to the kingdom. We, we hold total dominance over the board. If you're, again, if you're newer and you're watching this, you know, I don't really understand how this, this square thing works. You don't really need to. What you need to know right now is that square control is important, and you sort of need to familiarize yourself with the concept of, of square control complex. Okay, so an important moment has occurred. Let's forget about this pawn for a second. I'm not interested in that pawn. What I'm interested in is to prevent the move e4, e5, because that's how a square complex weakness is eradicated, right? You push a pawn onto the square, and you sever our control over that square. So we can do a couple of things. We can play the move knight e5 and literally put our knight on e5. That's the simple idea. But what I really like is actually now to drop our bishop back to f6, okay? Again, we're trying to keep maximum flexibility, we're keeping the knight on c4 for the time being. Maybe we'll drop it back to e5, but also we're attacking b2. And if white gives us a chance, I mean, we might take it with our bishop. And Jeffrey in the chat, by the way, thank you for that. We have Jeffrey Zhang, uh, leading American Grandmaster, participating in the chat live. So I feel the need to, to step up my own game, which, which is awesome. Um, so big, big shout out. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to follow. I'm going to shamelessly shill Jeffrey's new uh, Twitch stream. Twitch.tv slash JX, totally worth the follow. You see, I'm I'm totally corrupt. I just promote my friends and that's it. <laughs> People don't realize I'm not interested in ExpressVPN because friends get priority. Knight to D3. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, first we identify the threat. The threat is obviously E5. We have a gazillion ways that we can meet with meet this threat. You guys are probably thinking, let's go knight e5, but we're going to do it in a slightly more classy manner, okay? What we're going to do, well, what we're going to do is something very obvious, and you should see this possibility. There's a pawn. That pawn is hanging, and this will take a little bit of calculation. What pawn's hanging? Well, knight takes b2, right? Knight takes b2, let's calculate. Can white play e5? No, because white loses the queen. So after knight takes b2, which we're going to play, white has to recapture. Then we recapture with the bishop. Can white play e5? No, because the rook is hanging. But you might say, but rook b1, and we're going to lose the b7 pawn. Well, don't panic. First of all, you can lose that pawn and still be up a piece and still be winning. So after knight b2, bishop b2, rook b1, you can very well play bishop b5. And what we have done by taking on b2 is created a passed pawn on c4. And don't you know fall under the misconception that passed pawns cannot be promoted in the middle game. They very well can be, and they will be. And I'm tempted to go for this line just to show you that. But the clinical approach, if you really wanted to be greedy, is to drop the bishop back to d4. And after king h1, who can tell me a move that simultaneously defends the b7 pawn and prevents the move e5? We're not going to do this. We are going to go bishop e5 here because it's the simpler approach. Excellent. Dark tiger got it. Queen c7. Guys, b6 does not stop e5, right? You only check one box. The move was queen c7, right? It stops e5. And it defends b7. But much simpler is just to say, I don't care about this pawn. I care about this pawn. So let white take. What is white actually doing on b7, right? This is an, an area of improvement for a lot of players where they look at a piece like the rook and they say, well, I need to get I, I need to get rid of the rook. Let's go bishop c8. Let's go queen c8. You don't need to do either of these things because the rook in and of itself is not actually exerting any serious pressure. We don't need to go rook b8. We literally just want to push the pawn here. We go c4, and then once we go c3, the pawn is forever anchored to the bishop. You should think of this as a checkpoint, right? It's like a checkpoint in a video game or a computer game where you hit a spot, and you basically, you can die, but you'll go back to that spot. 
So the pawn on c3 is permanently anchored by the bishop. Let's get it there, and then let's reassess the situation. The bishop is undefended. Yes, okay, queen h5, big deal, right? Another one-move threat that we don't need to fear at all. All we need to do here is secure the bishop, right? How do we secure the bishop? Well, we have a nice way to do it. The best way to defend a piece is with a pawn. So that should be your default. Rook e8 defends it with a piece, and it weakens the f7 pawn. Don't like it. Yeah, f6. Now, you might look at this move and say, hey, but first of all, Ben Feingold. Second of all, are we not worried about weakening the seventh rank? Well, no, is <laughs> the simple answer, because white does not have the means, the firepower, to do anything about it. Again, this bishop on d7, it can't even be attacked a second time, if you look carefully. White can't put the second rook on the seventh rank. White can play the move bishop g2 to h3, true. But then we just trade bishops, and we can play queen c8 in that resulting position to force the queen trade as well. Even if white manages to create a mate threat, God forbid, if white gets rid of the bishop and then plays like queen g4, that's a one-move threat. We can always put a rook up to f7 if we're really worried about the seventh rank. So I think what you should be focused on as we're converting this advantage is just the power of concrete thinking and the importance of not being reactive in chess and saying, oh, this is scary because of X, Y, Z. You always have to, it's okay to think like that. You have to think like that, but you also have to look at the position very concretely and truly understand whether something is scary. So we take on H3. And now we identify the rook as an undefended piece. The queen is always a vulnerability. Combining those two together, we get the very classy move, queen d8 to c8, forcing the queen trade. And you might say, no, it doesn't force the queen trade because white is rook d7. And our opponent might play this move. Rook d7 loses the game on the spot. And I'll let you guys think of the reason why. And perhaps we could say this move in the chat. Even if white doesn't play rook d7, what do we do? Stress got it first, rook f7. But not rook d8. Rook d8 is the mopo, most popular wrong answer. It's the right idea, but rook takes d8 is check. It doesn't work. Rook f7 avoids the check and wins the rook on d7. Okay. So which rook do we take with? It doesn't really matter, right? You can play rook fc8. You can play rook ac8. But if you want to be super classy and if you want to use tactics to your benefit, notice that we have the possibility of a check on d4. And that can be used in the event that white takes a7. So rook ac8 is the clinical move, and it also sets a trap. Our opponent might mindlessly grab the pawn on a7 and allow bishop d4 with a fork. The reason, the actual reason I'm taking with the a rook, and I'm being super pedantic here deliberately, is because the other rook can be used for what purpose? Well, it can be used for the purpose of smoking the white rook out of the seventh rank with rook f7. And you might say, but didn't you say the rook on b7 isn't scary? Well, the circumstances have changed. Right now, our goal is to promote the c-pawn, and the rook on b7 has just become a nuisance because the queens are off the board. So our sequence of events is to smoke the rook away from b7 and then just basically push the pawn, supporting it, if necessary, with both of our rooks. And when the time is right, we're going to use our bishop to knock white's rook off of whatever blockading post it's going to occupy. So rook c1 has been played. We can start by pushing c3. We can actually do it in this order. Let's do it in this order. There is zero rush to playing rook f7. White still cannot take on a7, and he just did, and that ends the game. Okay, bishop d4. And this is how you integrate traps into your play, right? You talk about tricky players. To be a tricky player, you don't need to constantly BS and sacrifice move quality. If you're experienced, you can seamlessly weave traps with the way that you normally play. Okay, what do we do now? Well, there's one more nuisance to eliminate. So rather than c2, I like the simple rook f to d8, pick up the pawn, then go c2 and go rook d1 and dislodge the rook from c1, make white give it away for the pawn, and the rest will be easy. And you might be like, okay, the entire, all of these explanations in like the last two minutes might have been unnecessary, but my like coaching philosophy, my philosophy of helping people improve is to emphasize that when you promote the right kinds of habits in totally winning positions, you should think of these positions as a training ground for building the right habits, right? This is a low stakes situation because you know you're going to win the game basically whatever you do, although never underestimate people's power uh, to mess things up. So, you know, it's, it's like you still have to try to push yourself to be precise. And before you know it, um, you will start being precise in more complicated positions. I'll let you research the quote yourself and figure out who he was talking about. 
Okay, rook takes c8. And here comes Johnny, rook c2, and queen h5. And it's mate. No stalemate, plenty of pawn moves. The game is over. I miss mate in two, apparently. Shame on me. Okay, now the simplest is to drive the king back to g2, paving the way for a check on c2. So the retreating move, queen h5 check. Perhaps there is a faster mate. I don't care. I see a mate. We're going for a mate. And the ladder mate, queen d1, is coming to a theater near you. And that ends the game. And that was one of our longest games thus far, right? Around 40 moves, 39 moves. And it was a nice game. It was a, it was a rich positional game. And I have to give kudos to our opponent who played extremely well really until the piece blunder and and even you know induced i think a couple of inaccuracies so so let's delve into the analysis and this will be sort of an, a little opening overview on top of a game analysis all right let me pull up chess space so c4 e5 so th there's there's many schools of thought for for how to face the english and it really depends on which opening you play against d4 Right, so the first step is to, is to ask yourself what you play against d4. If you're a queen's game a decline player, c4 is the least dangerous move against QGD players because you can basically just play e6. And white, in many cases, just ends up going d4 and transposing. There are a couple of ways that white could keep a unique English flavor. So there is stuff you still need to learn. In particular, the most common is to play this ready setup with knight f3 and g3. White could play the move e4. But here after d5, you transpose into a variation of the exchange French that you have to learn if you want to play this with black. But realistically, it's not dangerous. I think this is the best move. And uh, black is doing completely fine. Now, things get a little bit more complicated. If, for example, you are a, let's say you're a Grunfeld player, okay? And if you're a Grunfeld player, just to show everybody what the Grunfeld is, the Grunfeld is when you play g6. Now, the king's Indian is bishop g7, allowing e4. And in the Grunfeld, you strike with the immediate d5. I might say, well, let, let, you know, what's the big problem? Let's just do that. Knight f6, knight c3, g6. White's going to play d4. No, white's not going to play d4. White's going to play e4. And Grunfeld players often get move order like this. And you've gotten move ordered into a king's Indian, right? You basically have to go d6. And after d4, you have a king's Indian. Which, by extension, if you're a King's Indian player, the English is also not a big problem for you because you can just go g6 or you can go knight f6 and g6, and we're basically happy. Now, white can keep the English flavor against the King's Indian, and it's actually quite an annoying opening. That's where white does not advance the pawn to d4. White keeps the pawn on d3. And that's partially why I like to play e5 against c4, even though I'm a king lifelong King's Indian player. So I've, I have played the King's Indian setup against the English, but I really feel that e5 is the principled line. Um, if you're a Slav player, you're also experiencing some problems against c4. The Slav is d5, c4, and c6. Does anybody know why the move c6 here? Like, what is the annoying line that Slav players have to learn on top of, of course, regular Slav stuff? And we're getting a little technical here, but nonetheless, what does white do here to try to move order black into a line they don't know? Yeah, e4. And after e4, d5, it transposes after d4 into a panov karo khan. Into a panov karo khan. It's, it reaches the same exact move order as after c, e4, c6, d4, d5 takes, takes, and c4. You get the same exact position. So if you're a Slav player and you want to play c6, you also have to learn the panov, which is not a big problem to learn, and black is doing totally fine. But you just have to keep these things in mind. And I think the easiest way to avoid all of that is just to learn e5, to invest some time and learn this move, and it exposes you to a whole set of positions. Okay? Panov is not a problem. Black is equal in the Panov, but you have to know theory. It can be very dangerous if you don't know theory. So what we're not going to do is delve deeply into all of White's English setups. I'm just going to introduce them to you. Apart from G3, which our opponent played, there is the four knights English, knight f3. And here, if we face this, we're going to play a super cool line that I'm going to introduce to you that starts with e4. This is a very modern line. It's a, it's a pawn sacrifice, and it's really only recently arrived on the scene. But traditionally, black plays knight c6, and here the classical four knights English is e3. You might have seen me with white play e4 a lot. This is a recent move that's really arrived on the scene. And the idea, as I talked about in the previous stream, actually, is bishop c5, the center fork trick, 95, 95, and d4. And let's see who paid attention in the previous speed run. If black plays bishop d6, he's already losing. Why is black already losing here? 
because of the move c4 c5 and black's minor pieces just collapse just cave in so so there's all this stuff but g3 is still considered the most popular and we play d5 reaching essentially a reverse sicilian this is an incredibly well-studied opening there is a lot of theory here but it's quite easy to understand the main setup for black which is why i'm choosing this as my official recommendation so after bishop e7 i'm going to plug this into chess base uh so that i don't give you any inaccurate information but to my knowledge the move e3 here is not particularly effective let me check how many times it's been played it's been played a handful of times and even by some strong players but it's not dangerous it's not it's not a topical line the main line continues d3 black of course castles kingside and here already there is a bit of a fork in the road there's a3 preparing b4 and there's bishop c1 to e3 this is the typical square for white's dark squared bishop just by process of elimination now by popularity the main line is a3 and here i'm just gonna introduce this line by showing you the next couple moves you play bishop e6 so you actually don't play a5 you allow white to play b4 and here you carry out a very cool trick we play the move a5 now what the heck is black doing black's just blundering upon b5 knight d4 and knight takes e5 looks like we've just blundered away a central pawn what's funny is that david howell the grandmaster he played this against me and he beat me with with white in this line but this is an exchange sacrifice that most people will stumble into unwittingly black's move here is bishop to f6 and suddenly white experiences major problems uh with his knights because if knight f3 then you take and you take on c3 and you win a piece the knight is nowhere else to go um so white has to support it with f4 if white plays bishop f4 black has a very pretty move and a, a very important idea to know. Anytime you have this construction, especially if there's a pawn on g3, what move do you have to remember? Black to play and win. If you're watching on YouTube, pause and figure this out. It's worth your while. g5 chases the bishop away and wins a piece. Very good. So white has to play the move f4. Now uh, black plays bishop e5, f5, and knight to b3. This is the crux of black's idea because if the rook moves then uh you have queen to d4 check forking the knight and the king so actually what black has to do and what david howell uh did is is just bishop c1 to e3 you have to cover the d4 square and sack the exchange but according to modern engines and i analyze this black has the move knight b6 to d5 you're trying to force trades because you're up in exchange and only black can be better here there are some correspondence games here um there are some otb games one of them continued uh, bishop c5 rookie eight and a guy named jensen 2470 im played 94 but it turns out after a simple move like queen d7 black is incredibly solid in the center um another otb game continued a4 and now very strong would have been just to solidify your queen side structure with b6 bishop d4 and now to throw in another prophylactic h6 to prevent the knight from jumping into d5 and then you go rook d8 or you can go rook a c8 and eventually bishop h3 black essentially is the only only side having fun here so we went quite deep but it's important to know this line because if white doesn't know what to do after knight d4 he's very likely to take on e5 now instead in this position the main line is knight back to d2 covering the b3 square but white can also play rook b1 this is second in popularity and this leads to some very interesting positions. So, for example, after knight d2, uh, black kind of eats into white's structure with c6. This is the theoretical move. bc, knight c6. And already I would argue that you can play this move OTB with black. Like, you can know only this, and you're already going to be fine. The main line continues rook b1, and now black cements the weakness on a3 by pushing the pawn up to a4. Another very typical move in such structures. And then you go rook c8. And quickly, you can reposition your knight back to d4 and even make your way to b3. It's an easy position to play. And I really think that unless white is super familiar with typical plans and structures, it's easy for white to fall into passive mode and get a worse position. The engine just gives basically zeros everywhere here. Last thing I'll say in this position is that if white plays rook b1, then you actually need to defend the e5 pawn. Now it is a threat. And you can do so by pushing f6 remember that if you have a bishop on this diagonal f6 
is not nearly as weakening as it would otherwise be. And now, again, the main move is knight d2, played by Carlsen and others. If white plays knight takes d4, then, of course, you recapture with the pawn to clamp down on white's queen side. Knight to a4, bishop to d5, trading off the fianchetto bishop, and black is doing totally fine. So this is a very short elevator pitch kind of overview, overview of the main lines here. There are side lines. White can play the immediate a3. b3 is quite popular as well. But uh, for the time being, let's switch back to what our opponent played, e3. Okay, any questions about that? Let's see what people are saying. I'm reading the chat. Jeffrey says there's a super GM subtlety after e3. You'll have to explain. So we castle. We allow the move d4 and we take it. And we reach this position. Now, of course, as I pointed out during the game, um, there is the possibility of playing knight takes d4. And by the way, I, I hate to jump around too much, but I did promise that I'll show you why the English can be dangerous if black plays kind of nonchalant developing moves. So let's rewind a little bit and talk about that for a second. This is important. So let's say that black plays let knight, e knight c6 and then bishop e7. Already black is worse. And the way to understand this position is to understand that black no longer is able to push d5. And if you're not able to push d5, that basically means you have to position your pawn on d6. And it's just passive. It's passive. White can play this common setup with e3 and knight e2. This was introduced to me as the Botvinnik setup. We played this with black in the Sicilian just a couple games ago. And black has no obvious plan. Cramped, passive. White has this typical plan of pushing the b-pawn forward and orchestrating some queenside pressure. And, yeah, you can play this. Bishop e6, castles. You can even try to push through d5, but... If you play it down a bunch of tempi, you're not going to enjoy yourself. And white can even counter strike with d4. And this gets super, super nasty because you can't take on c4. Uh, so, okay, you can play queen d7 here. But uh, after something like knight to d5, it's it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant. Um, and, and you should remember that, right? That's why you need a concrete setup against the English. There are setups where you actually put your bishop on c5. Um, and Jeffrey, I'll get to your point in a second. There are setups where you play bishop c5, but again, after e3, you're just biting on granite. And in some lines, black tucks the bishop away on a7 for like a rainy day. I looked at these setups. I think black is worse here, uh, partially because you're actually allowing the pawn to get to d4 in one fell swoop. So these are interesting setups, but I don't particularly like them. I don't think they're very sound. And and I think the way you should play is is d5. I'm, I'm pretty insistent on that. So we will, I'm sure, face this again, and we will talk more about theory. And Jeffrey is making a very interesting point. So after d4, e d4, apparently the move knight takes d4 was very strong. Very interesting point. Why is the move knight d4 so strong? Well, let's figure it out. Well, my plan was to play knight takes d4. I suppose white plays e takes d4. And the crux of the matter is that after we play c6 to halt the progress of the d-pawn, can anybody tell me what very scary move white now has at his disposal? And this is the entire reason that you move the knight on from f3 in the first place. And this should be obvious, right? Because at this point, you should have a pretty good grasp of what each side wants. Yeah, Phantom Master has it right. Black, white plays d5. Now you might say, well, why is d5 so dangerous? Well, first of all, white is eradicating his weakness, the IQP. But what often happens is that once the IQP is eliminated, the dam breaks and the side with the more active pieces is going to benefit. Now, which side is the more active pieces? Well, it's clearly white and it's because of the placement of this light squared bishop. Black's light squared bishop is still on its developing square. So if you forecast a bunch of trades here, after knight takes d5, I actually think white can even take back with a queen. Um, maybe white can take with the bishop, but that end game is quite unpleasant for black. The engine does give equality here with, with a precise play. Black needs to quickly put the other bishop on f6 to, to do the same thing to white that white is doing to black. But nonetheless, you can see that it's a little bit, it's a little bit iffy, and maybe, maybe white should play bishop takes d5. Maybe this is the way to fight for an advantage. And after bishop f6, maybe the queen can come out to f3, the rook to d1, and white is a bit of an initiative. That should sort of make sense to you intuitively. So d5 is actually unstoppable here, and you can't bring your bishop out because you drop b7, right? So these subtleties are important to appreciate, and that is why, according to Jeffrey, bishop e6 here was actually more precise than castling, because now, if white plays d4, who can explain to me what the difference is in this position? 
And now you should have the aha moment. Everything should kind of click. What does black do here? Not knight d5. Knight d5 is premature. You don't need to occupy the square. You don't need to occupy the square to control it. Controlling it is more important. C6, exactly. You play C6 now, and D5 is no longer possible because the bishop is an added defender of that square. Not Queen C8, guys. Queen C8 allows exactly what white wants. It allows the pawn to move forward. You need to control that square. Now, why is Knight D5 bad here? Well, Knight C5 is bad because you're biting off more than you can chew, and you can basically get Stein as Bart Lebend after takes in rookie one. I'm referencing a famous game where black encountered similar problems on the e-file and was never able to castle. Um, and, and thank you, Jeffrey, for this point. This is a very instructive point. And you're getting introduced right now to basically GM level opening theory and like how things work. But what you should take away from this is that everything can be understood, right? It's not like, oh, bishop e6 is better because it is. It's better for a specific reason that you can carve out with enough analysis and persistence. So in any case, we're getting deep here. Let's get into the middle game. We play bishop e6. White doesn't play. Knight takes d4, and we breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, so bishop f6, I think, is a reasonable move to attack d4. There were other ways we could play. We could put the knight on d5. We could play the immediate knight before and knight before to d5. I'm sure if you look with an engine, bishop f6 probably not the best move. To echo the line I was talking about, knight e4 is what I was really worried about. What's up, chess kid? Knight e4 is what I was worried about. And here we were calculating bishop d4, knight d4. And we concluded that knight d4 is very imprecise on account of this nasty little move, knight to c5. Attacking b7 and e6 and everything is kind of hanging in the air. But queen d4 breathes new life into this line. Uh, because if white takes and plays knight c5, now there's this fork. This is the line I was referencing during the game. Now you should see it. But in this position, it's really not the end of the story. And white can play a move like queen, no, not queen g4, but queen h5. And I believe that white has a very powerful initiative in response in, in exchange for the pawn. I mean, there's knight g5 ideas. According to the engine, black is totally fine after the crazy f6 to stop knight g5. But this is scary. I mean, the queen is vulnerable. White's pieces look very active. It leads to complications. It leads to a super complicated game. If you're interested, you can surf around with an engine, but I don't want to get too bogged down in the complications because bishop e3 is what really anybody under 2200 would play automatically. And knight to b4, preparing to increase our control over d5. a3 by our opponent, which I think is inaccurate because it sends the knight where it wants to go anyway. I think the correct move would have indeed been to play knight e4 once again. We would have dropped our bishop back to e7. And perhaps white can play knight c5. We go bishop d5. Maybe now it's time to chase the knight out of b4 since it can't get to d5. We would have dropped back. Ah, and knight c6 blunders the pawn. Aha. Uh -huh. So this would have been a nasty little way to play. It would have forced us to play knight a6. And of course now we have been forced to ruin our queen side pawn structure. Is it the end of the world? No, because we still have this big blockading piece on d5. But white can play knight e5 and keep piling it on. And despite the fact that white trades his fianchettoed bishop... With the queen coming to f3 and the knight to c6, you can sense that white white's pieces are a lot more active here. So these types of positions you want to try to avoid. I think after knight e4, white maintains a small advantage. Okay? So, but that's, that's very, very deep stuff. And a3 is intuitive. White plays it now. But now after knight c5, this has lost a lot of its effectiveness because we can take on e3. And then we can take on c5. And this is what I was discussing during the game. After knight c4, with or without queen takes d1, I think black is doing fine. White's pawns are quite damaged. And it's not so easy to keep everything under wraps here if you're white. Um, so, in any case, I think things really started going well. Things went wrong in the span of just a single move. I still think here that if black white plays the careful bishop c1, white is not worse. And the engine gives zeros, which I think is pretty reasonable. I mean, black has... We've gained a bunch of tempi, right? With white dilly-dallying around on the king side. But even if white just says sorry, as my old coach would say, just, I'm going to go back, sorry. White is still very solid, right? White is still fundamentally sound here, as is black. And the game takes on a very positional character here. The engine recommends a simple luft move like h6. Even knight d5 back to f6 is interesting to make space for the other knight and try to trade off some pieces. When you're playing against an IQP, 
you'd normally want to trade minor pieces because the fewer pieces are left, the, the, the harder it is to apportion resources because something has to defend the IQP. So if you don't have a lot of pieces left, you might end up just forcing all of your remaining pieces to defend the isolated queen pawn. There's a great Karpov Korchno game on this topic that I've shown before on stream. Won't do it now. Knight c5 is the engine line, and there is a trade on c5. The structure changes, and you get a very unclear endgame with both sides kind of having their share of activity. And Jeffrey makes an important point, which is that it is psychologically very difficult for really any player, but especially newer players, to play these types of retreating moves and admit that you messed up. And this is a big takeaway from this game, if you're considering learning from White's perspective. It's like when you have sensed that you just messed up, right? Let's say you fell into a one-move-itis kind of trap. You made a move that you thought was cool, and then you immediately realize that you've just twisted yourself into a knot. Your first instinct should be to should be self-preservation. You should make sure to identify the threats and then just make sure you're not losing any pieces and do whatever it takes, right? Because I think White's problem is that he just sort of panicked. He's like, oh, this didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And then you short circuit. But rather than short circuiting, you say, well, what specifically is Black's threat? Well, if you ask yourself that question, you should notice that it's knight e3 and bishop g5. Well, how do we prevent it? Well, you can do it from two different ends. You can move the knight away. You can move the bishop away. The knight is no good squares because knight f3 just happens to blunder the knight. I suppose knight h3 is a way to defend your minor pieces, but it goes without saying that this is ridiculously awkward and black is better. And so that really only leaves the option of moving the bishop away. Why not bishop d2? Because it cuts contact uh, between the queen and the pawn. But it's also possible, and it right, invites a move like knight c4. And bishop c1 is the best move, both according to the engine and according to what we, what we discussed. Um, apparently, according to Leela, bishop d2 is good. And even the move queen to f3 is not so bad. Attacking the bishop, and the idea is to meet knight takes c3 with... Oh, actually, f takes c3. Aha! Uh -huh. And you're counter-attacking the bishop on f5. This may seem to win a piece, but remember, the very knight that's being attacked can also do the capturing, not to be forgotten about, and it's a complicated position. So in this game analysis, we're doing kind of a lot of open-ended analysis and digging around, and this might strike you as boring and aimless, but hopefully this is helping you formulate a better understanding of these complex positions. You never know when these ideas can come in handy. So, you know, this was an open-ended game. It's hard to make any hard and fast conclusions, but I still think just analyzing deeply like this, it helps you acquire ideas and, and achieve fluency in complicated situations. Now, once the piece was blundered, I'm not going to talk too much about the rest of the game. I'm just going to make a couple of clarifications. Bishop g6 here allows h4. And funnily enough, after bishop f6, black is actually getting away with it. Black is getting away with it. Because after h5, we can play queen takes d4. And once the queen is knocked out, the bishop can then capture h5. But that's luck. And after e5, bishop e7, the bishop now has a retreat, not a retreating square, but an escape square on f5. All right. And so bishop g6 did work, but we did, we played a more conservative move, a safer move. And I also think the top move. And yeah, knight e2 is kind of, you know, giving giving the game away. Well, the game has already been given away. If I was playing white, I would have probably tried to muddy the waters, but this is still completely lost. I mean, this is just a free piece. Actually, bishop c6 might be inaccurate due to d5, which I missed. So perhaps here we should instead play pawn to c6 and really establish our control over this light square and then bring the bishop back to e6 and the knight to d5. Yeah, my, my apologies. Um, bishop c6 was indeed imprecise. Knight e2, we found this nice tactical move c5, carving out the weak dark square. And this is just a, a sort of stock idea that you should be aware of very con on a very conceptual level. It occurs very commonly in... Every opening, it's, it's a universal idea, but if I had to give you a, a simple example of an opening where an idea like this occurs super frequently, it is the Karo Khan. So take a look at a very simple illustration of this concept by none other than Alipin himself. And here you will see why players in the 1800s often struggled um, because they, they were often unfamiliar with sort of a basic positional concepts stuff that we now kind of take for granted so take a quick gander at this game this is a simple illustration of this concept in wearing different clothes essentially marco against the lapin two leading players of the 1800s 
Um, so in this position, it's an isolated, sorry, it's an opposite colored bishop end game. And white plays the move c, c, c3, c4. How do you think Alapin responds? Let's see who's paying attention to the, the general concept. Now, you identify the square you want to carve out. Very good. b6, b5. Excellent. And Marco goes right into black sands. He plays c5, and he yields this incredible square on d5, right? This is just a... Now, white is an equivalent square on d6. But the thing is, white put the knight there. The knight on d6 is just looks good. It doesn't actually do anything. The knight on d5 lords over the entire position. And black ends up winning the game by using the knight directly to break through on the queen side to create a pass pawn. And then he accumulates his pieces there, and he ends up winning the game. And eventually, the knight is replaced by a bishop. So the d5 square is, is an integral part of the way in which Alapin wins this game. Nowadays, people would kind of automatically, if we rewind, lean toward b3 and, and not yield the square. Now, black can take and go b5 with the other pawn. And here I would go rook c1. And if you think about it, in this case, the effect of the d5 square is still intense, but it's diminished because black has to reckon with the weakness of the c6 pawn, and, you know, it's diluted, essentially. Uh, but I can show you a zillion examples of this. I call this carving out. You're carving out a square. And we did something very similar here with the move c5, just wearing different clothes once again. Um, if d5, which happened in the game, we get this monster e5 square. If dc, then we come around, we pick up the pawn, and with the open d file, we're going to move our bishop away, and white's going to collapse very quickly. So d5, knight c4, bishop back to f6, controlling e5, winning the pawn on b2, and dropping the bishop back to e5, keeping our eyes on the prize, not fearing rook b7, pushing the pawn. Now the plan is very simple. You're going to push it all the way. Queen h5, f6, a simple defensive move, protecting the bishop with the pawn, and now a little operation to force the queen trade. Bishop h3 and queen c8. And again, if rook d7 here trying to intercept it, rook to f7 ends the game because the queen is undefended. There's no check on d8. There's no queen e6 because of just queen takes d7. And here this loses the queen. And so white loses the game. Takes, takes. C3. And of course, white hastens defeat. But if white had gone rook c2, we would have followed through with our plan. Rook f7. And then there's a million ways to win. But I like the move even rook to c4. Just go after the e4 pawn. Win both of white's pawns. And the bishop is more than capable of defending c3 all by its lonesome, it's also protecting the b8 square, so white doesn't even have this check. And the moment white moves the rook away, you push the pawn. Classic kind of concept, okay? So this ends the game, and the rest is clear without commentary. Phew. That was a rich game. That was a good game. I hope you enjoyed the analysis. A lot to take away from this. There's a lot of takeaways in the opening, and, and a lot of takeaways positionally, I, which I won't reiterate because there were a lot of specific things but you know i hope you've come away with the feeling that you, you're more comfortable with these types of positions especially iqp structures thanks jeffrey for all the insight this was super fun and uh you know thanks again to the people watching on youtube for supporting the channel and and making this possible with your subscriptions thank you all